everyone. If you're looking to advance your skills in Unreal, you may just want to take a look at our upcoming Unreal Engine training courses coming this fall to both our Los Angeles and Guildford training centers. Whether you're just starting out with Unreal or looking to unlock more of its power, our expert hands-on training courses will help you learn the core fundamentals you need. Follow the links to view more details and register. You'll also be able to meet us at Unreal Academy London this November, where we'll host the quickly growing community of architects, engineers, designers, producers, and artists revolutionizing the creative landscape outside of games. Our training event features three days of inspirational keynote speakers, hands-on sessions, expert lectures, and networking opportunities. Whether you're a pro looking to take your craft to the next level or just getting started with real-time design, there are courses for you, so register today and come see us. Finnish flag carrier Finn Air recently partnered with Zone, a virtual reality studio specializing in experience-based services to pilot a system that simulates the use of AI and visualized data to enable seamless operations. Learn more about how the studio developed a series of interactive VR and AR experiences based around digital replicas of Helsinki Airport and real-world thin air aircraft to provide a safe environment to train ground crew and how they're harnessing the power of data visualization to streamline flight operations. The disconnect between a client's expectations and final result can not only result in an unhappy client, but often introduces unexpected costs. Architects Tithi and Gautam Tewari are trying to overcome this issue with Trazy, a virtual reality platform that brings together all stakeholders in the architectural design process. Developed by SmartBizX, Trazy enables users to collaborate and facilitates interactions between designers, the end customer, and building product manufacturers. Learn more about how Trazy could help your own design workflow. And the full agenda for our Indie Dev Day in Seattle on October 9th is now available. The sessions include presentations from guest speakers and Epic developers on profiling and optimization, working with 2D art, the future of Unreal Engine, and more. If you haven't already, go register. On to our top Karma earners. Much love to Adno, Clockwork Ocean, Shadow River, Pavi Pavi, Noel Hoge, Levada, Lesky, Neo HS, F Innovations, and Asimio J. Thank you all for your contributions to our community on Answer Hub. You all are the bomb. Vivia and the Rivera Corporation premiered Anima. It's a virtual reality music experience for the title track Anima from Vivia's upcoming album. Inspired by the journey of a biomorph's life, the light, color, and scenes reflect a universal emotion. The team aimed to create a visual dialogue between the music, sounds, and ocular apparitions of Vivia. Gameplay programmer Jack Noble, currently working on the artful escape of Francis Vendetti, put together a super handy presentation on the do's and don'ts of platform development where he covers how to get started, packaging and cooking tips, iterations, and more. Definitely worth a read if you're developing for consoles. 3 of June is a 2D platform shooter video game where you play as an expired military robot reprogrammed by a cyber toy bear to destroy everything in the way of finding a little girl named June. I don't know about you, but I can't wait to hang out with Robbie Bear. Thank you for joining us for our news and community spotlight. Hey everyone, welcome to our Unreal Engine live stream. I'm your host, Amanda Shade, and this week we have a full house. I've got Grayson with us, one of our senior cinematic directors, right? Designers. Design, yeah. close. Designers, close. And uh, <laughs> a couple of our programmers on the team, uh, Jamie in the UK, and Francis, you're in Montreal, correct? Yes. yes. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, would you share a little bit about the kind of projects and things you work on? Sure, sure. So right now, I'm working, I've been doing a lot of work in Fortnite, and I'm also working on some special projects here, and uh, mostly work in cinematics. Secret things. Secret, secret <laughs> things, lots of secret things. And then, um, we're, uh, I, I think I'm mostly, mostly focusing on uh, virtual production related stuff right now. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about what I'm, what I'm doing right now. Nice. Uh, Jamie? Uh, so I work on the editor team 
I've been involved more recently in doing the Python integration for our editor, mm -hmm. uh, the multi-user editor, which we're going to show today. Um, I also own all of the localization and font rendering stuff in our engine. So if you uh, had a localization question, you potentially dealt with me at some point in time. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And Francis? I'm also on the editor team, uh, mainly working on multi-user that we'll show today. I'm also involved in virtual production um, with the remote control web API, uh, and more recently on working on open world stuff. Perfect. A lot of exciting work being done there. So I know Victor worked with you all to put together sort of a, a fun introductory video of kind of what we're oh, going yeah. to be covering today. That's right, the video. <laughs> oh. Cool. So do we want to start with that? Sure, yeah, yeah, sure. All yeah. right. Play it. So what we're going to show you here is going to give you, hopefully give you a little bit of context for what we'll be talking about today with multi-user. Um, so I'm going to show you the um, stage that we work on here at HQ. So this is our virtual production um, uh, mocap stage. And this is where we work on a pretty, pretty frequent basis. Um, you can see some of the equipment and hardware that we have here. This is a virtual camera. You can see the real world and the virtual world in it. Over here, you can see our multi-user station. And this is where we have a, um, several computers that we're all working together in multi-user. And, and these guys can define it a little bit better than I can. But essentially, it means that we're working uh, in the same level or series of levels together and that we can all work together on uh, a variety of different things. And so you can see these screens here. Um, all of the different users are in um, Unreal Engine in the same level working together. So to kind of explain some of the things that we can do together, uh, we can build a level out together or mesh an entire set if we want to. And so in these images here, you can see several different users meshing out uh, the small island. And uh, each of them is working on different aspects of things at the same time. Another thing we can do is uh, be collaborative with shots. So we can work on a shot together. Uh, we can, one person can frame the camera, another person can adjust depth of field, lighting. We can show um, things like, we can move you know, set pieces into the background. And all of this allows us to work much more quickly and much more effectively um, than a single, single person working on their own. And it's also a lot of fun because we get to be pretty collaborative um, because of the, the uh, multi-user technology. And it's, uh, it's really, really cool stuff. So. This just hopefully that helps set up some of the features and, and details we'll be talking about today in in the stream. Yeah, it's definitely an exciting feature, or the ability to get into a single space. It is. With it lots is of people. a lot of fun, and we we usually get out there, and you know, just a few people um, even. So we'll go f anywhere between seven to three people, and we usually are laughing and having a good time. <laughs> and it's also a great way to problem solve as a group. Uh, when you're under pressure and you've got to solve problems quickly, right. everybody can dive in and we can you know, solve different problems together. So it's, it is a lot of fun. It's really cool tech. Awesome. Well, would you like to kick it off and dive right in? Sure. I think, uh, Francis, are you up first? <laughs> or, oh. You reload it. I think, oh. Francis, Francis is taking a break again. <laughs> we're having okay. We're having some technical difficulties. I was like, all right. Um, it's not with the coffee this time. <laughs> all right, no problem. Um, so what what will he be starting off with? Yeah. So we'll be looking. Okay. So just to give you a little um, look at some of the stuff we'll be talking about today, uh, I believe Francis will be talking a little bit about the basics of a multi-user and how we how we set that stuff up. Am I back? You're back. Hello. Oh, there he is. Yay. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, so. Uh-oh. Uh and he's going. Oh, no. OK. So <laughs> until he's back, I'll continue to, to explain some of the stuff we're talking about. So we'll look at the basics of multi-user. And, um, and then after that, like the setup and, and those, those type of things, after that, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of the specific features that, you know, or some of the specific things that we do when, we are, when we're in multi-user. And explain you know how we do those and and uh, some of the, the variety of different uses for that, and we'll look at everything from like uh, level meshing to um, what things look like in camera and how we work together on a set, and we can look at um, different elements of uh, virtual production 
you know, and how we use this this technology at the studio. So it's really it's really, like I said, I think it's a lot of fun to work to work in uh, multi-user. Well, even seeing in the video in the way that you know they get to act, but you're getting to live in a different scene. Right? Yeah, and and we get to, and it's basically like it really is like playing in in the uh, in the in virtual environment, which is kind of fun. Mm -hmm. It's cool. I'm back. Hey, Hopefully you say that we're good this time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm back. Um, <laughs> all right. So hopefully this will work this time. Um, so first thing first, I'll just show how to enable uh, multi-user editing and start uh, a session together. So first thing you'll need to do is enable the, en enable the plugin itself. Uh, so you just basically look for multi uh, multi user editing here in the settings. I've already enabled hit here and the project. So you just enable that reboot editor. And in most cases, uh, you should be good to go. But since here we have like a more um, complicated setup with me being in Montreal and and Jamie in the UK and Grayson and and Carrie, um, you will need you potentially need to edit um, message bus settings. Uh, Multi-user is built on top of message bus. Um, so to properly set yourself up in a case where you're not using multi-user in the LAN environment, for example, you'll need to go into the project settings here, into UDP messaging, uh, which is the network UDP network extension for message bus, and edit some of your settings here. Uh, the default. In most cases, 000, uh, zero here is uh, usually enough. I'll use the default network interface for Windows. Uh, but in case where you have multiple network interface on your machine uh, in the LAN environment, you might want to force uh, the IP here to one of your uh, network interface. So uh, since in the LAN environment, multi-user uh, discover or message bus discover other uh, participants, um, using multicast broadcasting, uh, you'll need to uh, bind to a specific network interface for that to happen. And in our case, since we're not definitely not in the same subnet here, uh, I want to uh, enter the IP, the specific IP of the server we're going to use today, which is uh, being hosted on uh, Grayson's machine right now. So I've entered this IP here. Um, I don't need to force the specific network interface on this machine because I just have one, so I can leave that uh, to zero, zero, zero. Uh, one more thing to add um, here, the, the, the port that is bound is 6666. And this needs to be the same port as the one being used for the multicast uh, group that is used in uh, the UDP messaging uh, settings. So, once that's done, you're basically ready to go, and you can join the multi-user uh, session. So you would do that by accessing the multi-user browser, which is found under Window, Developer Tools, uh, multi-user browser. And this pops this window here um, that you can see. Um, so multi-user use a server client. Uh, architecture. So I mentioned earlier that uh, Grayson's hosting a server. So from this view here, you can see that we we found two sessions on one server, which is the live stream server mm -hmm. here. Uh, we have one live session and one archive session. We'll go over uh, archives uh, later down in the stream. So from from this panel, if I wanted to host or launch a server on my own machine, you you can access that here. You know, which would just launch uh, a server. We won't be using that one here, so I'll just shut it back down. Um, and then the rest of the options are just basically like creating a session, joining a session, and then archiving, uh, deleting. Um, so before I join, you, you can also access some um, multi-user specific settings here. Uh, right, let me dock that. All right. Um, so he, from here, you can usually uh, set up auto connect. So in some cases where you want a machine to automatically connect to a specific server and specific session, uh, you can set that up here. You would you know, place a server name here, 
the session um, and enable AutoConnect. In this case, I'll just specify myself with a, a specific display name. I will use the username of the machine if, if nothing specified here. And then you can assign yourself a color. In multi-user, we have avatars to represent yourself in the world. And you can you know, assign them a color, in this case, you know, just I? R. Yep. Could I mention something too about the color that I find really useful for virtual production and is that you'll see it potentially in this level too that sometimes in the environment, why we have those colors is that sometimes in the environment you have, you know, if you have by default a blue avatar, you, you pretty much disappear into the background. So having the colors is really awesome so we can really have the, the uh, avatars pop on the background. Yeah, uh, also you, we have two, by default we have like two tips types of avatar that we display in the world, uh, one for desktop user and one for uh, VR. We won't, won't be using VR uh, avatars, like VR in, in the demo today. Uh, but if you want a good example of that, uh, we had shown uh, early access of multi-user at the real-time live, Seagraph real-time live 2018. Uh, so if you go look that up, you'll see like a good example of using VR avatar with with multi-user. Um, you can also basically assign different uh, avatars that you can use. Uh, so for the demo today, I've uh, made one uh, specifically for, for the demo. So I'll just assign it to me right now. So those are just basically uh, blueprint actors that you can extend uh, from our presence uh, actor. And once that's done, you know, I'll duck that back here and from there you're ready to go and you can just you know click on your session and join it and from there I'll uh, kick it back to Grayson uh, for us to start editing together cool cool, cool. so right now I'm in um, a level and let me just show you on the screen here too the, the setups for the levels we have a persistent level and several sub levels in here um, at the moment. And then this is the multi-user um, display here. And what I'm going to be doing is basically just going in here and um, meshing, starting to mesh. And the cool thing is we can work as a group to mesh out this environment. And uh, I just like to, to uh, mention that, that one of the reasons we do this is just to kind of speed things along sometimes and we can kind of be collaborative and creative together. So, um, like, I'm also in the session. I'm receiving all of the changes that Grayson's making. Uh, hopefully, I'm sharing my screen and you can see it. But, uh, there we go. OK. Um, so all of the changes that Grayson's making, you can see here, they're coming through my history feed. Now, I'm not currently in the same level as Grayson, so uh, I'm not seeing any of those changes being applied. Uh, any live changes that come in for assets that are loaded are applied automatically. Uh, if the asset isn't loaded, though, then all of the changes are queued up so that if the asset becomes loaded later, the changes get applied and everyone stays in sync. So if I jump to the, the level that Grayson's in, then all of the changes he's been making. Hey there. I see you, Jamie. Yeah. Yeah. My shit is, should compile shortly. Um, there we go. Should we make it daytime, Grayson? Yes, I am um, going to toggle in. Let's see if you see. You see nighttime and you see daytime? Yep. Okay, cool. Great. There you go. Yeah, so like I can see here Francis and Grayson hey, there in the presence. As you see, that's, that's Francis's uh, customized avatar that he mentioned. Is that a chef hat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool, man. <laughs> I would like a chef hat too. <laughs> I thought that was so, a good um, show. Yeah. So as these guys are flying around, like we have some tools here for managing presence. Uh, so like if say someone was in a level and they're like, hey, can you take a look at this for me? And you have no idea where they are, you can just click on them. Like I'm now where Grayson was. It just orientates you to them. Uh, but at the same time, like they can get in your way. They can be a bit annoying. So you can also toggle their visibility off and back on again. And uh, this is controllable via blueprints as well. So if you want to set up like an action, like a button or something to show and hide a bunch of people at certain times, like if you're doing a, a take and you want to hide everyone, you can you can set that up automatically as well. Yeah, we, so, we do that a lot. Gonna be doing? I was just going to say we do that quite a bit in, in virtual production as well, that we're out on the set and somebody's in the way and we want to hide them. 
So, anyway. Okay, uh, could you do me a favor? Well, I'm, so I'll be working on some of these ground meshes here. Could you, uh, I'll add a can in, and if you could place it kind of somewhere you think looks cool, and just scale it down um, to sure. like 0.5%, that would be great. And I think it's maybe just kind of cool if y'all wa can watch us just you know do our thing here for a few seconds, kind of see how we how we can work together. So uh, yeah, like all of the changes that Grayson's making uh, that I'm receiving, they're all editor transactions, which uh, is essentially the system the editor uses to track, undo, and redo. So as a general rule, if you can undo something that's happened in the editor, you can theoretically send it over multi-user. Uh, we do apply a filter on that currently uh, to limit it to things that we are confident work. So it's primarily limited right now to actors and components in a level, uh, some supports for sequencer assets as well. But we're hoping to continue to expand live edit support over time so that we can edit more and more things without having to save assets during a session. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Would you guys mind, um, would one of you uh, scale, I don't know if you can see my, my presence and where I'm, but laser beam that I'm pointing at, can you just scale those rocks down yeah. to like, uh, let's try like point, point 0.5 or something. And I'm gonna move this stuff over here too at the same time. It just feels a little big in frame. I'm gonna, ch I'll change these too. So I guess long story short, these are things that we, we do on a pretty regular basis and and it's just a lot of fun, and uh, you know, I think one of the, the cool things is that we um, we can all look at a set together, and we can talk about it, and and make modifications as, as a team. And because it's like there's usually a lot of back and forth, like you know, how does that look? I don't know, man. It's cool. It's okay. Rocks look a little too big. Okay, then you know we can start changing stuff as a group. Right. Did you ever imagine that you would virtually be adjusting all of these things in real time with people literally on the other side of the planet? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> exactly. It, I, it's it's really neat. And I I this is this is just my own personal take on it, and I could be wrong, but I feel like this type of collaborative work workflow stuff is going to become more popular and I think we will probably use it in a variety of ways you know going in the future and I think there's even applications for uh, educational you know potentially educational things that oh, where people sure. can get in a virtual environment together and work together so I think it's it's really neat neat stuff um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'll change the light time into a night setup uh, or back into a night setup and a lot of times in virtual production, we'll roll with uh, an A and B uh, setup. So we may have some shots that take place during the day or some shots that take place during the night. Or we're not really sure uh, if we want to see night or day. And so sometimes we'll, we'll pre-set um, up a, two different levels, a daylight or day level and a night level. And then we'll switch them back and forth um, to, to look at different environments. So <clears throat> I'm going to continue to do some uh, mesh stuff here. and. Uh, Jamie, if you're available, if you can um, find the directional light in the uh, light level here, the night level, and if you could just set it down to one, I just kind of want to see see what the island looks like, um, just a little bit darker. That one? Yeah, that's that's not too bad. Um, yeah, let me let me pull something out of the way here too. Can you actually go? Can we try? Let's let's go up to like uh, ten, I think. On the um, sure. yeah, on the brightness. Thank you. That's ten. Yeah, it's a little. I mean, it, the other ones is pretty cool, but this has a little more contrast. I think. I think we're gonna. I think I'm gonna stick with that. Um, okay. If that looks okay to you guys too. So let me let me dig something up here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and and put a uh, campfire in the scene next. So this is a blueprint, and I guess we can talk a little bit about how we you know how we use blueprints in here. Yeah. Um, so, um, like we said that we can live edit assets together, uh, but when it, when you come to other types of asset, you know, not levels and sequence, like uh, Jamie mentioned earlier, um, those won't uh, live propagate basically. And you can also see in um, in uh, Grayson's uh, counter browser here, or Jamie's. I don't know which one we're we're seeing right now. This, yeah, this one is um, mine. I've got the, the uh... you, okay. So you you can see the little lock icon on on the campfire right now, saying that it's being locked by by me. So this would mean that um, 
Grayson cannot start editing uh, the fire right now. Since we don't live propagate those changes, uh, we want the asset to be locked until it can be safely, you know, saved, uh, propagated to all the other user. Um, so, Grayson, if you start editing the uh, campfire right now, okay, you, you got it. Do that for me. Okay. Um, since it's locked, you should see a notification once you start editing it at the bottom. Okay. Oh yeah, there we are. Right. Yep. Yeah. So since it's locked, it's just basically uh, telling you that even though you're currently modifying it, you won't be able to save those changes until I uh, unlock the asset. So by default, if no lock are uh, currently held on the asset, trying to edit it uh, will acquire the lock instantly, and then the lock will be uh, released on save. So right now, I'll just unlock the the asset so that. Um, uh, um, Grayson can save it. Uh, so on his side right now, if we can show like both um, Grayson's and Jamie's machine right now, you should see that um, Grayson see the fire while uh, Jamie's doesn't have uh, the fire yet. And that's because uh, the asset hasn't been saved. But once uh, Grayson do so, it will be propagated to all the other user. Um, we should see uh, the updated assets with the chains that have been made to the blueprint. Okay, cool. I will save. Let me go ahead and save here. Looks like it's updating there, right? Yep. So once that's done, the asset is, uh, is up reloaded on everybody else's machine. And now, as you can see, Jamie is see uh, the fire uh, as, as well. So um, like I said earlier, most of the assets uh, are, you know, propagated in that way, only on save besides um, um, uh, level and sequence, which we'll go over a bit later. Um, Jamie mentioned that we had like still some limitation uh, because we're filtering transaction basically. Um, in level, one big uh, current limitation we have is uh, landscape. If you do any landscape editing in multi-user, those won't be propagated until the level itself is safe. So in those cases, uh, what you would do is uh, save the level, uh, lock the level, I mean, sorry. Uh, on, and you can do that by right-clicking on the asset. There's a, a small uh, multi-user menu where you can uh, lock the asset from there, edit your landscape, and then save it. Uh, saving the level would then out reload the level on everybody else's machine, um, and you can continue to work uh, from there. All right, so Grayson, you can Yeah, you got it. Run. That's pretty, pretty cool stuff. Um, all right, so I'm going to add a camera. So let me just explain a little bit of what we're going to do here. So we can pilot uh, a camera that I've already placed in the level. And if you right click the asset, so the VCAM in this case, I'm just going to pilot the camera. And this is a, basically a virtual camera um, that we can you know, pilot around the level. And in virtual production, a lot of times we may have a scene like this set up, but we want to scout some different shots. And, and so I'm going to do that now and just kind of push the camera around a little bit. And you can kind of see how, how this type of thing works. Uh, we can change the properties on the camera. Um, you know, I can I can do the modification, or if I wanted to, I could ask uh, Jamie to to do a modification on, on say the film back. Um, but I'd have to release the camera. And this is this type of thing is actually pretty useful because sometimes we can, um, you know, I can ask him to do a change while I'm doing something else. And we kind of we already showed that, you know, with a level meshing. Um, but I just kind of want to point that out that that's sometimes part of our process. Uh, when we're working. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back. Um, I'm going to get a little bit farther away from the island here. And Jamie, if you could do me a favor, let me know if you can um, find the shark mm -hmm. mesh and unhide it. I'm going to while I position this camera. And then yeah, I'm going to be Okay, cool. And so what what we've got here is um, just a two operator setup. So this this particular case is where I'm going to be driving or positioning the camera um, and then Jamie is going to animate the shark. Can you show them how the shark animates? Sure. Thanks. So 
just so you can kind of, you know, are aware, when I have uh, the camera positioned, he can animate the shark, and we're going to go ahead and record all that. So can you pause that just for a second, and let me, um, let me dial this in here. Okay. Cool. And actually, I'm going to get just a little bit more up in the air for this. Okay, cool. And then we're going to use Take Recorder uh, to record this. So let me give it a scene name. We'll just call um, Island 1, rename it, and then I'll add um, the Bcam. And then we'll also add, uh, from the world outline, I'll type in shark here. Find our shark. Island shark. Now I could have just dragged that in there, but I sometimes I just like using the uh, sourcing, the add add button there. Okay, cool. And then I think we're ready. So um, Jamie, if you want to start rotating the uh, shark, and I'll start recording here. Okay. Ready? All right. So recording in about three, two, one. All right, recording. Let's red, let it run for a few seconds there. Okay. And then we'll stop the recording. And so now it's, it's processed. And then we can review our take and sequence here. And we should, if I did it properly, okay, that all worked. So we should actually see our shot right there. And so, again, the cool thing about this is that we can have multiple users doing different animations or running different cameras, um, doing different operations in the scene at the same time. And it, it really kind of frees you up to be pretty creative and get a lot of work done you know, pretty quickly on, on set. And that's kind of one of the goals of virtual production is to be fast mm -hmm. and to be able to be creative. So, cool. Yeah, it's magnificent. <laughs> okay. So, um, I guess, what else did you guys want to show? Do you want to so show us adding a, um, one of these tracks that will propagate? Or um, you can sh show the fact that the sequence uh, scrubbing and playing back has been, is actually synced across the, two, the three machines. Yeah. Um, you know, if I scrub it from here, if you stop it for a, yeah. for a sec, and I scrub it from my end, you know, you'll see that. And, all, uh, scrubbing itself that is, is an entirely uh, synced in parallel, but you see that um, it, it updates on our machine. Uh, when you use multi-user as well, there's a few new options that appear in, in the sequencer toolbar. Um, the three of them that appear, uh, like on the right side, you see like a little uh, people there. Um, those options there are, are there to, one, first is to enable the, the Playback syncing. So the first option on the left is that. Uh, the option uh, totally on the right is when you actually open a sequence. If everybody uh, in well, people that have this option enabled uh, will automatically open that sequence once you open it on your end. Uh, so that actually, actually, that's what happened here in this case when um, uh, Grayson started recording. It opened the sequencer uh, on Jamie's and. and my end automatically. Uh, so that's why uh, we all have this, this sequence already open here. Um, and like we said earlier, um, sequence uh, also an asset that will live propagate if you start editing it, which was uh, what Grayson wanted to uh, start doing right now. So I don't know what you wanted to edit. Yeah, I also wanted to mention something about the scrub bar. A really useful thing we find in virtual production is a lot of times we'll be looking at a shot as a group, and if we're at separate machines, we have to say, oh, can you go to frame, whatever. And with this, with the scrub bar being in sync, it's really cool because we can just you know, move things uh, to the actual part of the shot that we want to look at. And so it's, it's, it's pretty useful um, for looking at things as a group. Um, so I could do a couple things. I could, uh, do you want me to save the asset here? Francis, or um, just, just move this around, and so people can see. You can, yeah, you can just move it around. And yeah, see that's that. sure. Oh. Let me uh, let me unlock it. So in order to move things, you have to unlock it up here. Uh, once once things have been recorded, so I'll probably need to save the asset, right? Uh, actually, it should move on Jamie's machine as well when you when you move the track. Okay. If uh, if Jamie has it unlocked as well. Yeah, it's unlocked for him as well, I believe. And if you if you move it around, 
Yeah. May I save it, or do you? Or is that jumping a little bit too far ahead here? No, you can save it. All right, let me go ahead and save it. I'll just save that. Cool. So again, it reloads the asset. Okay. Like it did. All right. Well, I may have done something on this end, so I apologize, guys, for that. But <laughs> but overall, it's kind of cool to see all the scrubbing stuff work here. All right, cool. So that's mostly the things I wanted to show for uh, for sequencer, in sequencer. And uh, was there anything else you guys wanted to talk about in terms of multi-user? Well, yeah. Look, so in this case, you we've edited our uh, little level and done our little shot. So once you're actually done with uh, with your work, you would you would potentially want it to submit it to source control or something similar like that. Um, so uh, that's that's what we'll go over right now, basically. Um, so I think I'll actually share my, my view on my machine right now. Uh, just give me a sec. There we go. All right. OK, so um, in the case uh, where you're using a source control system like, like Perfor Perforce, like we do here, um, you know, earlier we were editing assets, we were saving assets. Um, that's something that wouldn't have been possible to do if those assets would have been locked in Perforce or not checked out or something like that. So basically, when you create a session in multi-user, what it does, it, it creates a sandbox of your project. So uh, all the assets that you actually uh, save and edit are done into that sandbox. So if somebody save an asset remotely, you receive that into your sandbox, you upload it from there. It's not touching any of the files you have on, on your workspace, on your project locally, or, or not directly. And once you're done with your, your um, multi-user session and you're ready to submit it, because you're satisfied uh, with it, then you would need to go into source control. Um, when you're in a multi-user session, you have uh, this new option that appears under source control, even if you don't have source control enabled, uh, like I do here. And once you click that, um, it would basically bring up a an option that takes a, a uh, a while because it's validating uh, basically all the, the changes that happen in multi-user. Oh yeah, all the changes. Uh, we made quite a few changes to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it basically brings up a uh, kind of submit um, panel, uh, but in this case it's uh, persist and submit files. Uh, I cannot submit to source control because my source control plugin is not enabled, but I have a list of the files that we've modified in this session here. And um, you can basically check the files that you would want to keep and, you know, and then click persist, uh, which I won't do right now because I don't have source control enabled. Um, and it, it will basically take those assets in the session and move them out in your local workspace uh, and check out those assets in this case. So usually the owner of the session at the end of a uh, editing session would uh, decide to uh, persist the file on his local workspace and then submit them to, uh, to, source, to source control. Um, before you do that as well, you can also uh, access um, a menu here, like you have the uh, asset history, and what this brings is is basically the list of modification or transaction that happened on that asset. You can access it like I did here uh, in the multi-user menu, um, but you can also review uh, basically all the changes by just using the the session history that that we have here. Um, right now, the, the the changes that are in like the Basically, the line here are kind of uh, a little bit obtuse. They can be a little bit obtuse, but if you want to know a bit more about what happened in like live stream modified this subtract, um, you can 
access a detail panel that um, it's not always super useful and we might uh, want to improve that down the line, but you, you get like more details into exactly which property were modified. Uh, in this case of a track, it might be a little bit um, like, like scale and, and transform information. Yeah, like, yeah super exactly. useful so, for that. Yeah. So here, the island shark that we modified earlier. Uh, so the root component was modified. Um, you also get in the history, you also get like all the lock and the unlock of, of assets, uh, the camera rig, um, you know, basically all flags that were modified uh, are in there. So you yes. can use you can use this to review what change in your session, and from there, this is this decide what what you want to persist. Uh, it's pretty useful not. if you break it. You know, if I broke something in a session um, by clicking the wrong flag on a on a blueprint or something like that, it it's really useful. I you know to to track that down to figure out what flag did we click that suddenly hid this thing. We didn't expect that to happen. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so one more thing that we can do with this is uh, I mentioned earlier, we mentioned earlier archiving. Um, this, this is kind of a, another way, um, not, not to persist things to source control, but to uh, save the session history. So if I, if I disconnect here uh, right now, it will basically revert all the changes that we've done in the session uh, back to my initial state since I uh, haven't persisted anything, right? So if I if I go back in my level right now, uh, like I have, I have like the original set. I don't have like the I had, you know, I think earlier there was like a, a fish here and a few other things and a few uh, a few other stuff were hidden. Um, so all of that got reverted when I, I basically uh, left the session. So and if you actually you can... if you toggled the uh, the set the actual set because it is showing our the set that we that I pre meshed you know ahead of time so it's down at the bottom. Oh yeah, and, and that'll kind one? of show. It's just basically um oh, this. yeah that one yeah so you can see that's the um, the basic the default island there. There's no yeah. there shouldn't really be any meshes on there. Cool. Mm. Um. So if you if you want to, uh, you can basically keep that session for archiving. We already have one here um, uh, from from yesterday. I think we did, which is uh, basically it will uh, archive all the changes from from this point on. And this is useful for a few things. Uh, internally, we've used uh, we've used that feature uh, for reproducing. Uh, bugs, you know, like people were using multi-user in some situation and then encountered a crash, be it multi-user or not. Um, and, and then they would archive their session, send it to us. And what we would have to do is just basically, you know, sync to the same base they use for that session, uh, which you can see um, in the session engine version and tooltip. And we would just sync back to this version you know, like restore, restore the the old session, connect to it. It will re it would it would replay the whole history, and then we would re-encounter that crash, and and then we would more easily be able to fix. Uh, but it can also be just for you know archive archiving purposes. Um, we don't have it in this build, so this is like stuff that we might uh, we. We will improve in the future, um, but in the same case where, like, let's say we happen to crash in in this demo uh, that we did, which never happens, um, <laughs> we would have been able to just again like rejoin the session and would have replayed the whole history, and would have we, we could have kept working from there directly, or we could have um, archive. The session uh, while restoring the session edited the um, the history, like basically removed the last few transactions. For example, if those were the thing that um, made us crash, and then rejoin and like basically not lose any work. Since all of that is hosted on the server itself and not in the editor, it's really really you know uh, crash resist resilient basically. That's so useful uh, in the virtual production when we're out, you know, on the set, 
and you know I move a light or somebody moves a light that you know I did something wrong the light and the session, you know something crashes it's so nice to be able to just pull that right back up and continue working it really helps for a flat, fast workflow yeah um, I think uh, there are a few things we want to use this technology for as well I think uh, Jamie had the uh, uh, mentioned it earlier at the beginning of the stream when he was uh, working on uh, disaster recovery. Uh, right, Jamie? Mm, yeah, so like as Francis mentioned, since this is very resilient against losing data, uh, one of our uh, one of our alternate uses of this technology uh, that went out in 4.23 is uh, for disaster recovery. So there is a plugin you can enable which will create a local multi-user session with you connected to a local server running on your machine and it will keep a track of everything that you've done while you've been running the editor. And if, if you do encounter a situation where the editor does crash, uh, when you restart it, you will get an option to say, hey, uh, what do you want to restore? And you can either restore everything and see if that works, or you can restore down to like the last thing before you did, or like back in history, uh, until you can find a point where you, you can avoid losing work. and. Um, as we continue to improve the live edit functionality and let you edit live edit more and more things, that will become more useful over time because you don't have to wait for an autosave or you don't have to have saved an asset to avoid losing some work. That's incredible. Yeah, That's step by cool. step and it seems like a good way, you know, to debug too. Just keep stepping back until yeah, until you figure <laughs> out what happened. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Maybe not the most efficient way to do it, but yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> An option. Wow. Do you have more magical things to show us? Uh, I think today that was mainly <laughs> it. Um, uh, we can move to user questions if, if there's any. Oh, they got questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you're ready. They never have questions. <laughs> I don't know why they ever have questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're wondering if the multi-user editing works um, without LAN or VPN together. Together? I guess. Uh, Let's start with where it does work. Like it, it works in LAN situation, and in our case, using VPN. It, right now, um, it well, it technically could work over uh, the open internet, but I wouldn't suggest it. So <laughs> I, you know, like def if you want to do that in a, in a non-LAN situation, definitely, definitely use uh, VPN, um, at least for now. Uh, it's not that we might not offer a solution down the line, but um, for now it's LAN and VPN. All right. Let's see. Um, they're wondering, do all users seem to be running the exact same version number of Unreal? Yes. Um, like the server does when you uh, start um, or try to join a session, uh, it check a few things on, well, it will check, obviously, the project you're using, uh, make sure that that's the same one, uh, the engine version, um, the, if you're using uh, source control, basically, the, the exact revision you sync to. Uh, if you have the source control uh, module enabled, it will check if you don't have any file checked out or modified. Um, and basically prevent you from joining the session if if yeah. that that happens because basically it won the same base for everybody and the same code for everybody that makes um, sense. forward yeah uh, there is a way to circumvent that if you really know what you're doing mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't suggest it there's an option on the server that you basically can boot the server with a certain command line argument. Um, which is in, in the documentation, um, and <laughs> <laughs> that that would allow you to circumvent all those checks and join a session. But not recommended. Um, definitely not recommended. <laughs> I, yeah, I, don't, I haven't heard what that that, that name is on mm -hmm. on the stream yet here, so I guess it's maybe not. <laughs> Risky business. Um, or have I? So they're wondering, uh, <laughs> does saving progress pause? Uh, I know you had saved earlier. Does it pause the other individual screens while you're doing that? At this time, yes. Uh, Jimmy, did you want to add to that? Well, it doesn't pause other people, but it, it blocks you while the slow task runs. 
uh, any progress that comes in while you are waiting is applied after the reload is finished. So you're still in sync with everyone else. OK. Um, is it is it possible if you attempt, like what happens if you attempt to move, if both of us wanted to move a rock at the same time? Can you can multiple people actually grab an item at once, or does it just kind of it, figure out who grabbed it first? And <laughs> Yeah, uh, so it has a locking mechanism. One, an implicit locking mechanism, an explicit locking. Uh, during the demo, we kind of shown the explicit one, right. where uh, which is basically asset based. You lock an entire package, an entire asset. Um, we might expose an explicit one for actors uh, down the line, but uh, we wanted like a better UX UI for it to uh, to to work properly. Basically, like lock uh, details panels and, and things like that. Uh, but right now, an implicit locking happens when you you grab a let's say you grab a rock and you start moving it. It, it will basically implicitly lock every object that is in that transaction, so other user cannot operate uh, on those objects while you have the lock on them. Basically, so it it will refuse um, that that transaction or revert it back, apply yours, and then. Um, so once you release the, the rock, the other person can modify it. Okay. Uh, it has some, you know, maybe we, sh we could increase the granularity down the line. Like, have you modified the, the scale or the other modified, I don't know, some other properties. But for now, it's the whole object that's locked. It's pretty useful, too. I mean, we have tons of cases where all, you know, a few of us are out of the stage and everybody wants to play with the same camera at the same time and it, th you know, it can throw stuff off. So we can't, you know, obviously in multi-user, we can't do that. Um, so it's it's nice to, to uh, basically, if you've set something up and you want to keep it in a certain place, you know, nobody else can touch that that thing for a while, which is cool. Nice. Uh, let's see. So there, someone was setting, they were talking about setting up a desert native server to do some tests and they were they found it more memory intensive than performance intensive and uh, they were thinking about increasing memory RAM to support that and I feel like we were talking about that a little earlier that that's where that's probably the the place that they need the most help yep. is in RAM in supporting these situations is that correct uh, on, on the server the server is not really uh, in the per like CPU intensive as far as the work it does, but um, yeah, more definitely if you save bigger asset because basically the the uh, server uh, keeps it, some of those package in memory. It needs to send uh, send them, so it needs to uh, copy um, that data around multiple times. Sometimes, um, obviously, uh, like older version of a package, we basically have a a cache of things we the server keeps in, in RAM. The rest is dumped to disk. Uh, but if you save a lot of big assets, then then the memory footprint of the uh, the server can can grow, um, and will improve that down the line. Uh, but definitely, yeah, more memory intensive than CPU intensive at this time, I would say. Okay. Um. Sort of an interesting question. They're asking if the multi-user server can remain active without Unreal Engine running in the background. Yes, it's a totally different. Um, in in the editor, there's basically like a button to launch it from there as a you know um, helper, uh, but you can run it on its own. You can run it on another machine, like in this case, Grayson hosted it. Um, it could be, you know, a dedicated machine where you leave it there running. Um, you know, we only add one session on it, but the server can run any number of sessions at the same time. Um, I think that's how we rolled today too. We just started up the server, you know, on this machine first, and then we loaded into you know, the editor, or I loaded the editor. I believe. I believe. Yeah. Sounds right. Um. Let's see. They're wondering if baked light maps and such propagate as well. Uh, they should. I 
don't think I've tested that <laughs> specifically, but let, let's say like build, map build data, for example, if you fake static lighting or something like that, once that one will propagate on save. Mm -hmm. um, uh, multi user is still beta. <laughs> there right. might be uh, some reloading problem at that at that this point in time. Uh, but but yeah, it will propagate and not reload uh, the the map build data in that case. So so it should work. Okay. They're so wondering if multiple. Uh... You can edit different shots in the same sequence. So can you be working on different <clears throat> shots at the same time? Do you guys want to answer that? <laughs> um, Jamie? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That sounds like something you should know, Garrison. Uh, we don't. We know. If, we're, if we're not we, sure, that's OK. Typically, we don't do that very yeah. often. Most of the thing we do in virtual production, most of the time, is we're working together. And, and a lot of the ways that we should, looked at today were Somebody's very common thing that we'll do is, you know, somebody will have a shot, you know, they'll be in control of the camera. Yeah. Um, and then two other people, somebody will be adjusting lighting, somebody will be adjusting depth of field. And so we often work a uh, single shot at a time. Mm -hmm. um, that makes so, sense. Yeah. And then um, someone's wondering how does undo work? Is it a an undo your own or is it a global undo? So if you see someone move it. You're like, no, I don't like that spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't have, uh, so it's not a global undo at this time. Okay. It's like if you undo, basically, it will add a new line in the session history, which would be like your undo of whatever you've, right. you've done before. Uh, we don't have any editing of that global history right now, beside what we've mentioned with the restore, which will be coming out uh, later. Um, but we might, um, you know, like uh, improve that so that you have more granular editing. But I don't think we'll do like a global undo where it's free fall for people to uh, undo yeah. the changes of anybody else. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> um, and then, kind of cap us off. Uh, where are we moving next with multi editor? So, what kind of things can they see upcoming, or what are some of the next features we can see coming out for it? Jamin, you wanna take <laughs> that one? Uh, there's uh, a few so things. Yeah, so like uh, um, coming in 424, I think we have improvements for the session management. So as Francis mentioned, you'll be able to filter sessions when you archive and restore them now. Mm -hmm. uh, that feature also came from disaster recovery because you do the same thing when you restore a disaster recovery session. Um, beyond that, I'm much more fuzzy. We have some grand goals for it, um, mm -hmm. but I can't say when those will be. So for example, like currently the multi-user stuff is between two editors. Uh, if you're running an editor in game mode or if you're running a cooked editor, then uh, a cooked game, sorry, there's, uh, you can't interact with those. Um, as, a, as a longer term goal, we would like to get a multi-user able to connect to a cooked game so that you can have full performance on like your render walls or something like that. Um, and also for like local iteration on content. Um, blueprint exposure for um, uh, creating and sending custom uh, multi-user events. So if you have something that isn't uh, able to be done via the editor transactions, uh, you can create custom events, little structs in, in C++ currently, and you can send those yourself. You can hook into our multi-user stuff and, and send and receive events and uh, handle this for them. Cool. Uh, but you currently have to do that in C++. So uh, we're also okay. going to look at exposing that to Blueprints so people mm -hmm. can create user-defined structs in, as assets and hook them up in Blueprints and script things that way. Yeah, so sequence uh, scrubbing is done is done with those events yes. instead of gotcha. relying on transactions. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, it's pretty neat. A lot of things coming up. Well, I think that's all we have for today. Thank you so much. I know it was. Uh, we're bringing people all over together in this it's, moment to get it's these cool. Working. I mean, it's great. So we get really to you know literally do a live session <laughs> to get two different people in yeah. different locations. It's pretty neat. Yeah. So thank you all again for all of your time. Thank you everyone for joining us. I have a few quick notes before we wrapped up. You may have seen I tossed a survey into the chat. That's for um, us to find out 
what topics you would like to see. So please let us know. These are for you, so share with us how we're doing and future streams that you would like us to do. Um, also, uh, we have meetup groups all around the world, so if you'd like to join people that are also working on Unreal projects or get feedback from them, that's meetup.com slash pro slash slash Unreal Engine. Um, they're a great resource. Um, also, please join all of our online communities. We're active in the forums. There's a, an Unreal Slackers Discord that's incredible, Facebook, Reddit. If you would like to see yourself on the spotlight, we do these fun as part of our countdown. Uh, it's 30 minutes of development compressed into five minutes of video. So just email us via community at unrealengine.com, and we can take a look. We'd like to know your game name or your project name, um, your studio name if you have one, and yeah, we can work on putting those up here. If you're streaming on Twitch, use unrealengine.com, and as always, follow us on all things social via Unreal at Twitter. Um, Again, thank you all for coming by. It's and fun. We'll see you next time. Cool. See you all next week. See you all.